Hello, how's everybody doing today? Awesome. Well, it's an honor to be here and, uh, you know, we just celebrated World Parkinson Day and um, I've done this event several times and the NeuroChallenge Foundation is, is really just a, a remarkable place where there's, there's hope and there's help and there's just people who care and, um, and I'm just, I'm so impressed with, with everybody that's here. So we should stop and, uh, and acknowledge what a great job these folks have done because it's... So I've seen a lot of symposia across a lot of, um, a lot of geography, not just the United States geography, and, and this is, is really uh, one of the most active and engaged communities uh, that I've seen. And so it's just um, it's terrific to be here, and I thank you for the invitation to speak, and I'll try to bend your ear here for a half an hour or so and, and tell you a little bit about what's going on in, in Parkinson disease and maybe tease you uh, a little bit. So this is uh, our group, and um, I hail from a small town called Gainesville. And it's just a little bit north of here, and we're a college town. Um, any Gators in the audience? Yeah, all right. So uh, I always say that um, you know we have nice buildings, and, and, um, and it's a really nice uh, place, but it's always the people. And one thing that Parkinson has taught me over the years that I've been involved uh, with it as a specialty, both on the clinical side and the research side is it's always the people. And so anything that I say to you, I really wanna make sure that we credit these people who are on this picture for doing all of the, all of the great work. And so we stand on the shoulders of, of others. And so it's a team sport. If we're gonna get something done in a disease as complicated as Parkinson, and remember there's no more single complex disease in all of clinical medicine, not just neurology, than Parkinson's disease, that so we're going to have to do it with, with groups. Uh, we were very privileged uh, here in the past couple of months to open a new institute um, called the, the Fixel uh, Institute, and uh, we uh, remain committed to the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary care uh, of patients. And we also, within the last year and a half to two years, opened a freestanding uh, neuromedicine hospital. And so, um, so we believe in the perfect patient experience, and we believe that uh, that uh, patients should be uh, should be treated in these team-oriented uh, uh, areas. And so, come visit us. At, well, our new building will be going opening in uh, July of 2019. That's my my daughter, and um, she didn't want to give the hard hat back when we took the tour of the building. So, as you can understand that, and this is the hospital. Okay, so th this is, uh, these are my disclosures. I, ha I am uh, funded by the federal government, by an agency called the National Institutes of Health, and by several foundations, including the Parkinson's Foundation, which is uh, most appropriate for this talk, but not by any uh, industry sources. I don't have any honorary or any of those um, conflicts of interest. And, um, and these are the federal grants that support some of the research that uh, I will show you. And you always have to, uh, to uh, say thank you to the people that support your efforts. So the four simple words that you have Parkinson's disease, uh, these uh, words and are going to pierce the heart and drain the dreams of at least 50,000 people worldwide each year. And that number continues to grow. And it should be something that um, that draws our attention and something that, that, that we, should, we should care about um, as a society. And this is a, a famous Chinese philosopher and also um, was also a, a physician as well. This is Lu Jun. Does anyone here know Lu Jun? So when I lecture in China and I show this picture, everybody goes wild, you know, for Lu Jun. So he would be like LeBron James, you know, um, here, or Tom Brady if you're a football fan. And so Lu Jun um, had a lot of, of really important philosophical observations. And one that I really particularly like when speaking to Parkinson groups is to talk about the road. And so Lu Jun talks about hope and talks about roads. And he talks about hope cannot be said to exist nor can it be said not to exist, for it's just like roads across the earth. For actually, before the earth had no roads to begin with, when many men and women and people pass, in that way a road is made. So in other words, if we want to rise to the challenge of Parkinson's disease, like we've risen to the challenge of HIV, like we've risen to the challenge of 
polio, like we've risen to the challenge of breast cancer. If we are to rise to the challenge, then many of us are going to have to walk together. And as we walk together, that's how the road will be made. And so I think it's important to remember that. And I think the, the communities of people with um, degenerative diseases like Parkinson, it's so important for us to be getting together and, and moving forward. So one thing that I have learned um, over the years of uh, treating patients and also uh, in doing a little bit of research is that the, the patients always plant seeds. And one of the seeds that they're very good in Parkinson at planting is that seed, that seed of faith. They learn how to grow hope and they learn how to discover new core values to achieve happiness despite having a chronic disease. And so it's really important for me to emphasize that even though you have Parkinson's disease, it's a very livable disease. And actually we have patients, and I've seen this over many years, that we diagnose with Parkinson, and they live better lives after the diagnosis of Parkinson than before. They find meaning and purpose in their lives. And so I think that's always important to, to talk about. Now, how big is the problem? I mean, what are we facing? Well, I hate to show really busy slides here, but it's quite easy, even in an audience this size, to look at these graphs and see what's going to happen to the number of people with Parkinson's disease. So if you look at the graph on the top, you'll see those are just the arrows in millions. So you have 2.6 million in 1990. You have 6.3 million in um, 2015. And in 2040, 12.9 million. This is the world's eight or 10 most populous con uh, countries. We know there's more than eight or 10 countries in the world. And this is people over the age of 50. And this is data that was um, calculated by Ray Dorsey, who's a very good neurologist at the University of Rochester in New York. And the reason that I show this is, is look very carefully at the growth rate. This is not actually going to be a linear growth rate. It's going to be an explosive growth rate. And the reason that it's explosive is that we are aging as a population but also because of the industrial revolution. In the last 200 years, we've industrialized ourselves, and so now we have all sorts of chemicals, all sorts of other exposures that are now um, interacting with our genes and our DNA, and this puts us at higher risk of Parkinson disease. And Parkinson is more common in men. And the greatest achievement of the last 100 years has been doubling the lifespan, not the invention of email doubling of the lifespan, okay? And with that doubling of the lifespan, you can see, even if you look at the person graph at the bottom, the numbers are going to be unbelievable, excessive. This will bankrupt Medicare and similar organizations, similar healthcare organizations, whether they're public or private throughout the world. And so we have to pay attention to degenerative diseases. And so I wanted to just show this to make sure that this is emphasized that as we put toward our research effort that we think about this. We're in the process now of, of getting ready to publish a book uh, about the Parkinson pandemic. So we talk about it being a pandemic. It's not infectious, you know, we, at least we don't think it's infectious, but, uh, but it is on those levels where it's happening in every country around the world and the growth is explosive. And so this will be with Way Dorsey, with Boss Bloom and Nymogen in the Netherlands and with Todd Scherer, who's the CEO of the Michael J. Fox Foundation. So the four of us have been endeavored to write about um, this journey. And we, we opine that this journey will be similar to the journeys that we took on polio and the sim similar to the journeys we've taken on HIV and cancers like breast cancer. So what's another issue that we're facing as we move forward in Parkinson? Well, we're clearly not training enough Parkinson specialists. So how many specialist neurologists are trained in the U.S. each year for Parkinson disease? Shout out a number. How many neurologists, specialist neurologists, are trained per year in Parkinson's disease? I just told you the, the unbelievable numbers. So how many are we training? 2,000? 200? 50? All right. 
give this man a, an icy and a, and a uh, and a, and a little Debbie, he wins the prize. It is, uh, it is very close to 50 on the number. So if I show you that number of people that are suffering with Parkinson, and then I tell you this is the number of people that we're training, you know we're in trouble. By the way, just also to, to show you another degenerative disease, how many people are we training in Alzheimer's disease? How many Alzheimer's neurologists? A disease that at the moment has maybe four or five times higher numbers than Parkinson disease, but Parkinson is actually growing faster. How many do we train in Alzheimer's? Shout it out. 500? Less than 20. Okay, all right. Just um, don't have a nightmare tonight because of me. I'm just giving you information, just delivering the information. So, so this is an issue. And so as we move forward, we have to develop better models of care. This is one that we uh, published in the in JAMA Neurology called the Service and Science Hub. And the idea is, is, is that Parkinson has taught us one thing. It's taught us about the ability to put complex care networks together, um, put them under one roof, make sure we have patient-specific plans. You've met one Parkinson patient. You've seen one Parkinson patient. It's the most complicated disease in clinical medicine when we consider the over 20 motor and non-motor features, as well as the response to medications. And you use pumps and deep brain stimulation and gene therapies. It gets very complicated very fast. You want to make every patient a potential research participant. You want to track uh, outcomes in a database so you can improve your care. And you want to make sure that the relationships are bi-directional so that your um, health care providers aren't leaving, right? You want to make sure that they feel the love as much as you uh, feel the love and that you create a bond within your communities. So a model to move um, forward with the care. And when we think about Parkinson disease and how we manage it, this is a, a review article uh, from the Journal of the American Medical Association. And what's remarkable about this, and it's impossible to see, and I only do this to torture you in an audience this size, but I have made two bubbles on this slide. And the bubble on the bottom, what I'm showing you is, is that we've shifted our thinking. So experts now are using exercise and interdisciplinary therapies like physical, occupational speech, and swallow from the time of diagnosis. From the time of diagnosis. This is different than what has been done in decades past for this disease, and it seems to make a difference. The big bubble, the big elliptical bubble in the middle, you know, as Parkinson goes on for more years, so the bottom is how many years you have it, that's where you start using therapies like pumps and deep brain stimulation and other cocktails of medications. And so exercise and multidisciplinary therapies and DBS and pumps and medications, all of these things have their place in the life cycle of a Parkinson patient. And there's not one right answer, okay? There's not one pill with one certain color that is the right answer for any one patient. The answer is individualized for each patient and as you change over time, your therapies change and your choices change. And so it's not like everybody should get this or everybody should get that. And so we have to work together with our patients and with our industry partners to make sure we're delivering the right therapies uh, at the right time. So a couple of tips that I've learned in practice that I'll share with you. Uh, the first, this is uh, from a, um, a novel, uh, from Jillian Lauren's novel. Uh, she says, I look for a sign, where to go next. You never know when you'll get one, and even the most faithless among us are waiting to be proven wrong. And so the reason I show this to this group is my apologies to my colleagues in the Alzheimer's Association, but one of the best things that you can put in your pocket from today is that you don't have Alzheimer's disease. It's a very different disease, and, and it turns out that patients with Parkinson disease feel when they're diagnosed, they feel that they have Alzheimer's or Lou Gehrig's or, or something else, and helping people to understand what they have as well as what they don't have is an important part of the process of living with the disease. And so you have scores of people and communities, um, perhaps uh, hundreds of thousands of people worldwide who, who actually believe that they have something that is on the level of disability with Alzheimer's disease and they don't. And so it's important for us to, um, to understand that. And so one of the secrets we like to teach patients are understanding what you have and understanding what you don't have. 
Another little secret that, um, that I like to talk about is um, this quote from Joshua Harris. So the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. Wow, this is like a U2 concert. We could sing it together, right? Okay, so, um, so you know, a Parkinson patient, um, it's more important for, for an individual patient to have the timing of the medications right than it is to have the purple pill or the yellow pill or the fuchsia pill or whatever the new cocktail is. And so as you go to your doctor over time, Parkinson's is a cueing disease. The circuits in the brain that are, that are dysfunctioning are circuits that are important to cueing things and cueing movements. And so having the timing right, the timing is absolutely critical to the success. And so, so if you're not paying attention to timing, start paying attention to that more than the actual uh, newest uh, thing that you have in your pocket. And this is my morbid slide. This is a quote from Jared Kintz. Jared says, I have a favorite cemetery I go to because it's really clean and the doctors and nurses are all very nice. <laughs> I have a favorite cemetery I, go, cemetery I go to because it's really clean and the doctors and nurses are all very nice. So, so we laugh about this. But I tell you in terms of research and tell you, tell you in terms of our understanding and advances and, and from, from dealing with this for many years, and there's been dozens of papers on this topic, hospitals are very dangerous places for patients with Parkinson disease. And so it's just as important as knowing about all the new drugs and new therapies is to understand that, that if you can handle these things in the outpatient setting, and then if you are hospitalized, knowing what to do when you're hospitalized is actually a great thing that can really change your life. And so this is a quote by Florence Nightingale who said, the first requirement in a hospital is that it should do the sick no harm. And these are hospitalization kits. And so those of you that have had children know that when you're getting ready for the child to be born, you pack a bag and you put the bag by the door and you keep going in and you're getting contractions and you're not sure, you know, like, is it real? Is it not real? What am I going to do? Do I have the right clothes? Am I going to make it through this hospitalization? Because you never know where you're going to have to go into the hospital. Well, we need to do the same thing for Parkinson's. And although we have an electronic medical record that was uh, mandated um, by the Obama administration in 2011-2012, we still don't have the ability to get people within individual hospital systems doing all the right things with Parkinson patients, even with the electronic age. And so we have sort of reversed the equation and said we have to teach patients and families how to teach the hospital how to better care for them. So these, these uh, kits, they have um, lists of medications, they have all sorts of um, tips for the hospitalization, they tell the nurses what to do and what not to do and what medicines to give and what medicines not to give. And this can be life-saving, this can be a life-saving tip so important. We learned from uh, a number of medications, about a half a dozen were done through the Parkinson Foundation through a, um, a multidisciplinary group that three out of every four patients in the hospital don't get their medications on time every time, okay? And remember, timing is critical, and so put that in your pocket as something that's important. Now, when we think about any new device or any new drug, this is sort of the curve. This is a famous curve. I didn't make this up. That when there's any new technology, there's a trigger for that technology or that drug. Then there's an expansion of the, what we see, and there's this peak of inflated expectations. You see the new thing, and you're like, oh my god, that has to cure Parkinson or whatever it is that I have. And then people realize, OK, this new thing didn't cure it contracts and there's actually a trough of disillusionment. Oh my God, it doesn't do what I thought it was gonna do. But then hopefully it does something, okay? And, and then you come up to what's called the slope of enlightenment and a plateau of productivity. And so this is the course of any new therapy that is um, introduced for any disease, whether it's device or whether it's drug. And we go through this cycle multiple times and even in Parkinson's disease. So I'm gonna tell you about some of the new therapies and where old therapies are becoming newer. And here is one example of that. This is a quote by Robert Fanny who says, I'd like to say we're all just ghosts on a wire seeking the prick of an electric thought. 
Who would have thunk that you could put a lead into the brain and push out about this much electricity? Look at my fingers. I mean, they're almost touching into the circuits of the brain and change how people are behaving and improve their symptoms. But it turns out now, fast forward a couple of decades, that this turns out to be a potential reality. And so a number of years ago, this is Kelly Foote, and I've had the privilege of working with him for a couple of decades on, um, on this area of research and clinical care. And we were asked to do one of these TED Talks many years ago. And, and the TED Talk, the idea that we came up with that we thought was worth spreading was, was simple. Your brain controls everything. It's what makes you human. It's what makes you, you know, who you are. And we can control your brain. And, and so you think about that, that should make everybody go, oh, <laughs> this is not good. But any therapy that we use whether it's a drug, whether it's a device, whether it's an exercise therapy, fundamentally is changing the context of how your brain is functioning. And we have to begin to think of it in those biological terms. So any of the therapies that I'm gonna show you potentially could change the way the circuitry is working and can change the control of the brain. And so remember the brain is a living supercomputer, so there are 100 trillion connections. We call the connections between the cells synapses, and in fact there's tons of connective tissue we call glial cells, and it makes still the single best supercomputer. It's not a PC, it's not an iPhone, it's not a Galaxy tablet. It's still, your brain is still the single best supercomputer that we have. And when we think of this, we think of a therapy where we can stick, as you can see in this cartoon, a straw into the brain and push electricity into any of the small structures which we call gray matter structures, but also the connections between structures which we call white matter structures, and we try to stimulate a circuitry and change how a whole circuitry is communicating with each other. And that is the fundamental principle. And so we've seen this over a number of years. And so where is this therapy going now? Well, you can see this is a, a patient that we did many, many years ago, maybe a couple of decades ago, with a, with a tremor. And you can see this is a patient in the operating suite. And then if you stimulate within a very specific area of the brain, you can see that the, um, that the tremor is going to improve and he's gonna be able to smoothly um, draw that same spiral. And what we've done is disrupted this disruption. There's an abnormal conversation going on in the brain. Now, what we did in the early days was we just pushed electricity through that straw. I mean, it seems simple enough. Not sure exactly why it would work, but it did work, and now we spent a few decades trying to figure out how it would work. But maybe that's not the most efficient thing to do, to just keep pushing electricity at a brain continuously at 100 or more pulses every second. 100 or more pulses every second. And so when we think through how do we get to these outcomes and try to improve devices which can also cause side effects with things like talking and walking and thinking, maybe those devices don't need to be on all the time and maybe we can understand the languages that are underpinning some of what we see. And so in traditional deep brain stimulation, you can see here a picture of somebody preoperatively with some shaking with Parkinson's disease and stiffness and slowness and then postoperatively, so from your left to your right, you can see that he improves. Nothing that is really too tremendously exciting, but you see the patient on the bottom talking to us with the walker there. This is a patient that despite deep brain stimulation or the best medical therapies, we still end up with problems with walking, balance, talking, and thinking, walking, balance, talking, and thinking. And so the new therapies have to line up to the symptoms and understanding that circuitry of what's going on in the other areas of the brain so that we can modulate it for as good of a response as we see on the top. We can help the person on the bottom from not falling or for better thinking, and we're not quite there yet. But the technology that you'll see moving along, we've been doing this for a few 
uh, years in our own laboratory, and but many other scientists are interested in this, is called closed loop or adaptive deep brain stimulation. So trying to get the signal, understand the signal and decode it, and have it only respond when it needs to. So when it sees tremor, it responds to tremor. And we, in our laboratory, we can do this in Tourette, we can do this in essential tremor, we've been working on it for freezing of gait, and there are actually a number of different um, projects through the National Institutes of Health, what's called the Brain Initiative. You may have heard about that. And a lot of the dollars for the Brain Initiative are going into therapies that may benefit patients with Parkinson's disease. When we started on this, this was maybe uh, 12 or 13 years ago, we actually studied a disease called tics. And early on, we realized this is a, a patient who has Tourette, you all have heard of Tourette. She has these abnormal tics and we can record out of multiple areas of her brain and we can create a detector. And so you see one area is Grand Central Station, that's like the EKG line on the top. The middle area is the, the cerebral cortex that's on the, on the top of her brain. And the bottom is a detector that tells us and can predict when she's gonna tick. And from that, we've been able to build a technology now that we've deployed into six humans to be able to detect the ticks and respond in real time. And so understanding each of the symptoms in the brain and trying to decode them and then put this into the right language and have a device respond to it is a new technology that we should be looking at for Parkinson and for tremor. This is another project that, um, that we have with, uh, with tremor which is uh, um, perhaps a, uh, an easier project and maybe takes it a little bit closer to uh, what uh, some of the disability that, that Parkinson's disease patients have. And you can see here, this is a, a patient who is trying with the left hand to lift and bring the hand over and, and pour from one cup into another cup. And the idea of the project was, and this was part of the, the, the brain initiative, was creating this EKG like phenomenon. You all have had EKGs where they give you the rhythms on the heart. So now imagine you're going to see something that, that, um, that is in real time now where we can read the signals in the brain in real time. So now you're seeing an EKG. This is completely implanted under the skin and in the brain of this patient. And then on the bottom, similar to the Tourette patient, here it's in pink. You can see when he needs to use that left hand, the device is able to pick up the tremor and able to deploy. So it only needs to be active when that particular symptom is abnormal. And now multiply this and realize we could use this for multiple symptoms and multiple diseases. So what about medications? So Franklin Roosevelt said, you know, one thing is for sure, we have to do something. We have to do the best we can at the moment. And if it doesn't turn out right, we can modify it as we go along. So that was Franklin Roosevelt. And when we think about Parkinson, I like to think about it in three buckets. So we want to develop symptomatic therapies that are powerful in one bucket. In the middle bucket, we want to slow the disease down. And if we could slow the disease down five, 10 years, we might actually outlive the disease. And the third bucket is the cure bucket, the C bucket, which is actually where we're furthest away from. But if we're going to see cures, when we see that type of innovation, it's probably going to be in the small percentage of patients who have single gene defects, at least at the beginning. And so we're closer to looking for therapies in that middle bucket that are going to slow the disease down. And it turns out, here's a number that are, are already through the FDA for other uh, indications that have been tested or have been tested and looking for neuroprotection. And so repurposing drugs, once we understand the mechanisms and how they could prevent a disease from progressing, is something that you need to keep your eyes on. And you'll see a few studies coming out um, here that are, are big dollar NIH studies and Parkinson's study group studies for um, isratapine and, uh, and some neuroprotective uh, studies uh, for, um, for a gout drug. And we'll look to see if these are actually uh, helpful for Parkinson. Now here's a quote from T.S. Eliot who says, I've measured out my life with coffee spoons. Does anybody feel this way? I, I certainly uh, can, can empathize with this quote, and it turns out that for Parkinson patients, coffee, tea, and exercise, as Dr. Fernandez will tell you um, in the next talk, 
these are really important to changing the miracle grow, to changing the chemicals in the brain and how they're interacting with each other and with the Parkinson cells. And there's definitely a symptomatic benefit, so an improved symptoms. There might be, on some of the risk studies, some changes in risk with coffee, tea, and exercise. And we don't know whether they're protective. But it was long held that you don't drink coffee if you have tremor. But most of that is actually with a different disease called essential tremor. And now studied by Ron Postuma in Montreal, it turns out that mild to moderate cups of coffee may actually be good for some of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And so I say don't take their coffee away. Now it's important for us to develop a biomarker and the reason that we need a biomarker, and a biomarker is something that allows us to be able to measure how much gas we have in the tank and how it's changing over time. So how that gauge is changing and we need to understand that gauge over time. If we can develop a biomarker, this is one by David Valancourt at the University of Florida looking at a marker on a regular garden variety MRI scan, it's called free water. If he can look at the progression of Parkinson over time, then when he goes to Dr. Fernandez to do a study, instead of asking Dr. Fernandez, give me 3,000 patients, he can say, give me 150. So we actually don't have that yet in Parkinson, and when we do, it could be a game changer. And so when we even do studies not only on drugs, but things like exercise, do we have something that we can look at to gauge whether it's actually changing the course of the Parkinson disease itself? A comment on stem cell research, this is uh, from Ron Reagan, son of Ronald Reagan, who said stem cell research can revolutionize medicine more than anything since antibiotics. This was the, uh, the thought of the day, and of course, you remember through the, um, the Bush administration and, and, and through actually the last three administrations, it's a big issue, stem cells and stem cell lines. Well, in Parkinson's disease, this was kind of the mad lib. This was like, give me your money, and in five years, we're going to cure the disease. And it turns out that stem cells are kind of like your kids. Okay, So my apologies to those of you that don't have kids, but uh, if there's a little bit of heartache with your kids, right? They, they grow up, and they develop, and they become what they want to become. Getting your kid to do everything you want to do is really hard. So these are young cells in the brain. We can turn them into dopamine cells or any cell that we want, but getting them to go to all these complex regions in the brain and do what we want, maybe that's possible in cancer, but it hasn't um, fulfilled its promise in Parkinson. It's very hard. It's a very complex disease. They are very good for screening new drug therapies, and so keep your eye on this. But if anybody asks you for 50,000 bucks to infuse something into your arm with stem cells, be a little bit cautious and make sure you go to the Parkinson Foundation and get their list of questions you should ask because there is a business called stem cell tourism where you can get uh, sold down the, down the river on some of these things. And so uh, there are very good uses of stem cells, but I just want to make sure that everybody here understands where the direction has shifted uh, a bit in Parkinson's disease. And finally, William Foge uh, said that vaccines are the tugboats of preventative health. And this is um, uh, my uh, final comment for research in telling you that there is a great area of brain medicine that is opening up called neuroimmunology. So you have an immune system, and the immune system clears things that shouldn't be there. And we can now give antibodies peripherally, and this has been done by Joe Jankovic and colleagues and many people. There's a couple of national studies going on to try to potentially address Parkinson. They've done this in safety studies. And we can also give vaccines to try to get the brain to begin to react against these proteins that shouldn't be there called Lewy bodies. They're filled with this nice candy substance called alpha-synuclein that we think we need to clear. And so this has the potential trying to unlock the potential of vaccines and maybe neuroimmunological and neuroinflammatory approaches to try to get after the disease. And the big question here is, will we clean the brain like with a toothbrush? Will we clean it off and end up with a totally clean brain without these depositions but still have Parkinson's disease? Will we get side effects or will we be better off? 
But this is something that I predict we'll be able to answer within the next five to 10 years. And perhaps this may be the beginning of a, a, a newer therapy for this disease. So with that, thank you for the um, invitation um, to speak here to you today. Uh, it's been a, an honor. Um, these are uh, some of the books that we've put out with the foundation over the years on secrets to a happier life and breakthrough therapies for Parkinson. And soon we'll be talking about the Parkinson pandemic and we'll need you all to get on board and sign the petitions and, and really get involved so we can become like polio and do what's right for this disease. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today.